Um, you know, I, I can make this kind of free form, I think, uh, if you have questions, especially. Um, uh, so, you know, if you do, just go ahead, and, uh, and but I'll kind of launch into a couple of things. Um, you know, I had the opportunity at, um, uh, during my job to train a lot of people, and a lot of people coming out of undergrad and uh, MBA school. And I thought I would go into a little bit like how we would describe, how I would describe our business to someone new um, who didn't know much about it, and then uh, go into like some of the pointers we would give to, to new people um, who were just starting up. Um, and one, I guess to, to preface this, I think the most important, one of the most important things we looked for in new people um, was not you know, technical ability, because um, almost everybody who showed up had a, lot of, had a lot of hard skills, had a lot of technical ability. Um, what we looked for was really someone who enjoyed making money, you know, like an entrepreneurial type of approach to our business. You know, we were in a big institution like Citibank or Solomon Brothers or whatever, wherever I, I was working. But at the end of the day, it was all driven by a bunch of people who were doing their own business. And, um, you know, entrepreneur, sort of an entrepreneurial approach or, a, or a, an attitude of, like, how do I build this business was the thing we looked for more, you know, more than the, te the technical skills. Like, all things being equal, we'd always choose someone who had started their own business, you know, um, during school, for instance, or um, was coming um, after, you know, after business school or maybe out of undergrad, but after having had some experience um, running a business and showed in their resume, you know, that they were trying new things or, you know, for traders, right, someone who um, was trading even with their own money, maybe not trading, but had, you know, investing and had a view, right, on something, someone who had apartment buildings or, you know, launched an online business of some kind. That, that type of thing was very attractive to us. So that's kind of the preface, but, um, you know, I, I think our business is, is, has some similarities to large, other large organizations because, um, you know, if you, if you just start a job and you do what someone tells you to do um, and you just keep doing that for years and years, um, and never understanding how you get paid or how your boss gets paid or how the institution makes money, then at some point you'll be out of a job, right? Because um, the business environment is so dynamic uh, that you really can't afford to just kind of sit back and do your job every day and, uh, and, and uh, just assume that everything will be fine. Um, so anyway, that's kind of a long preface. But let me get, let me get into like exactly what we did. What, what I did... Um, I was a trader. I was, I was, uh, my job was structuring and trading. So what that meant was that my firm gave me a certain amount of the balance sheet, okay? Go to Banamex in Mexico and buy a call option on a basket of Mexican stocks. And he, what, he, what he wanted to do is buy it, and then what we would do is sell pieces of it as a warrant to high net worth investors who were looking for exposure to Mexico. Um, now this is 1990. At the time, the U.S. market was totally dead. I don't know if any of you know the history. The U.S. market in 1990 through 93 was basically a flat line. Okay? It, was, it, was, um, uh, it was a very dull, kind of uninteresting market. But the emerging markets were like the big hot thing. So everyone was looking for exposure to in emerging markets. And we happened to have, uh, if we, we didn't have any call into Banamex, but my boss just decided he'd find somebody who was at Banamex in, in the equity markets area and say, can you sell us an option? And so they did. And, and we, we bought like a two-year option on this basket of Mexican stocks. And, um, and then we sold it to... We, we found, we, we scoured around the Citibank, we found some people who were covering German um, high net worth investors who were interested in Mexico. So we said, okay, we'll sell you 
Uh, you know, we bought 10 million of this. We'll, we sold it in like 100,000 pieces to um, individual um, German high net worth investors through, uh, through the local stock exchange. So my job was to kind of structure the option and turn it into a warrant, which is really converting an option into a security that can be traded on an exchange. So um, it was a big, just long learning process for me to do that. But I think what I learned from that experience is that you have to make your own, like I was, watching, I was observing my boss who was doing this, you know, he, no one was telling him what to do. He had to make his own, he had to kind of stumble around and, you know, skin his knees and a few times and he, and he made, a, made a lot of mistakes. But eventually, he had a good idea. And the idea ended up making, I don't know, it probably made our desk a couple million dollars um, in, in, in a short period of time. And suddenly, the success kind of breeds success. So then we started seeing more and more of this type of thing come our way, like inquiries from people, like, can, can, can you do it in Argentina, or can you do it in Brazil, or what else can you do? And so um, it, it became sort of a mini business that ended up sort of going from zero to like $20 million sort of revenue within a couple of years. And then I left, um, and I went to Solomon Brothers, so because I, I could see that as if you're an associate, you're not going to make as much money as the person who, you know, my boss was making multiples of what I was making. So I, that's why I went to Solomon Brothers. Um, and it, they didn't have the same business line that we already had already established at Citibank. So I thought, well, this will be great. I can just do what, I, what I've already been doing. Then when I got to Solomon Brothers, it was a totally different game. And, um, and I had to learn how to actually trade instead of just brokering uh, derivatives like I did at Citibank, I had to learn how to trade volatility because they already had an established book there. But what I, what I found over the next you know, 15 years of working at Solomon Brothers is that our product life cycle was probably six months to a year. So when I landed at, City, at Solomon Brothers in 93, we were making, I don't know, a lot of money every year, 50, 60 million dollars a year on one particular product. But then a crisis hit in 93, 94, which is the Mexican peso crisis, which destroyed that entire business. Um, and we still made all of our money, but then the revenue stream just kind of dropped. So we didn't lose money. We just didn't have, we lost opportunities to make money using the same product. So we had to figure out a way to make, to reestablish our, our desk. I actually thought I was going to get fired at that point. I thought, well, you know, it was, it was fun. You know, I had to get, get uh, you know, three-year run in this business, it was fun, but I'll go do something else. But, um, but after the Mexican peso devalued and, and there was all this stress on the market, what we discovered is there are all these market dislocations, right? Like there were, there, there were Mexican banks who had issued c CDs that were guaranteed by the Mexican government, and the CDs were yielding you know, like four or five percent more than Mexican government debt after the default. And this was after the U.S. government had gone in and lent Mexico directly, um, you know, billions of dollars. So effectively, you had this kind of implicit U.S. government guarantee in some level for Mexican banks. And we started getting customers saying, hey, can you show us some Banamex CDs or some Banco Mera CDs or whatever? at, you know, can you source them for us? And we found we could, we could buy them. We, we had a branch in Mexico and we could go out and buy them and put them on our books and we could do the same thing um, uh, in terms of brokering, just making money brokering time deposits, <laughs> you know, which is a plain vanilla kind of product, very plain vanilla product. But at the end of the day, it was, it was so, um, the fact it was so simple the reason it was successful because you know, at the time there was no one wanted to buy any, any real risk. But if you could buy a three month or six month CD at you know, 14 or 15 percent at, at the time, then uh, it looked pretty good and it had a you know, reasonable chance of paying. And actually all those, bank, all those CDs did, did pay and we built up a big book of Mexican bank um, time deposits. And then that led actually to customers saying, well, you know, in Brazil, there are these local, um, local bonds that are like one year and under, and they pay around 20% in, 
in, uh, in dollars. They're dollar indexed. They're denominated in local currency, but they're indexed to the dollar, and they pay you 20%. Um, but there are all these taxes and all these other issues why people couldn't buy them. So we ended up sort of going from this Mexican peso CD business into, into now um, local bond markets in most countries. Um, and then that, that business is actually still there, um, but it kind of spun off businesses like options on those. Oh, yes, please. Uh, no, I just, um, <coughs> before you get too far away from it, I just I was thinking, I just want to ask the question. I mean, you mentioned that at one point you were kind of afraid of getting fired. Yes. Because, you know, the whole thing with the Mexican uh, the peso crisis. But you had just made the company like all kinds of money in the years before that. I guess that's one of my questions with, with that business is, is why are they so ready to just like kind of let some of these star players go that have earned all kinds of money in the past? But I don't know. Does that make sense what I'm asking? I guess well, like why would that you think, be a real fear? You think if you're a manager, right, and you're running this business on, in emerging markets, right? So your, your, your business is emerging markets derivatives, right? And so you have this revenue stream that you've historically you see as like, you know, whatever, 20, 30 million a year kind of going up. And suddenly one year it becomes like, you know, nothing. So if you're the manager, okay, or if you're, I don't know, CEO or something, then you have to make a strategic decision, right? Do you stay in this business or not? Is this going to be a business that is a good business going forward. And so we were worried, this is Solomon Brothers, okay? Solomon Brothers is not exactly, you know, a stable environment. They basically were, you know, they'd hire, it was like working for a hedge fund. You know, they hire people, and if you made money, you're great. If you didn't, you're out the door. It's kind of like, the, since you guys, that was kind of your niche, and since that's what you'd really been concentrating on, and that market was gone, it was like, can these guys make something new? Right, can you now reinvent yourself right into something? Okay. Now, so that's kind of the position we were forced. We, I mean, they gave us some time, right? They said, okay, well, you, you, know, you, you really don't know how much time you have. You know? <laughs> All you know is that you walk in and you're still, you know, at least, you know your, your ID still works, right? And you walk in. <laughs> so um, that's kind of the way, I mean, okay. you know, it's fine. But everybody, everybody knows that going in, okay? So it's fine. It's like that's part of the deal. But, but you, theoretically, you're, you know, it's risk return, a high risk, high return, right? So theoretically. Um, so anyway, um, that's kind of, uh, that gives you, I guess, an overview about how, what, what types of businesses we did and how we, th hopefully it's enough background to get into the next thing that I was going to talk about. Um, but when, when people came in, you know, since we were doing, since we, our job was sort of to do sort of new, new stuff and keep the old stuff going, we developed a little metric that kind of helped us put things into some boxes that we could understand, <laughs> or try to understand. Um, so, so what we did is, what we did is we said, okay, here's how, here's how we think of our, um, our business, or maybe, maybe our business on a sort of an ongoing basis. We said, here's the P&L, okay? This side is, is our profit, okay? And this side is time, okay? So we'd say, um, you know, more time versus less time, or less time versus more time, okay? So we'd say, okay, let's say that you, you think that you have an opportunity that takes a lot of time, like this is here, takes a lot of time but is a lot of potential, a lot, potentially a lot of money, okay? Now, is that a good place to be? Well, it depends, right? Like we used to call these, you know, elephants. You know, like sometimes you see like a big opportunity and it could be a great opportunity. You could make a lot of money, but it usually takes a lot of time. And if you're in a business where you get paid at the end of the year based on your production that year and you spend all your time that year working on something that's going to make $20 million, but it makes nothing, then you may not even have a job at the end of the year. So elephants were kind of risky, were kind of a risky business. There's another type of business that was sort of not much time but a decent amount of money. Um, 
we used to call these like the, mach the machine. So this was kind of our normal business. It's like the bread and butter business that kept everybody um, paid. And what we'd find usually is that if you were successful with one of these, then you'd try to replicate it, right? Again and again and again. And then if you did, your elephant became a machine, right? And the spread would be lower and lower probably as you went, but it would still be, you know, a decent spread. And then this, this one we call a commodity. So at some point, it takes no time, but it makes also no money. So eventually, like a machine becomes a total commodity and you can't do anything with it really. It just makes you a tiny bit of money. Maybe customers love it because, you know, it's the economics really more in the customer's favor at this point in terms of the spread, the time, and the effort that it takes to get you there. But um, we, would, we would try to get out of the business, right, if it became a commodity. And then the big thing here is there were always something, there, there was always a decision to make with um, an elephant because you never knew if it would be in this box or this box, right? So you always had to make a judgment call or as time went by, you had to make this judgment call about whether you should spend all your time on something like this because you never knew which direction it was going to go. And the people who were successful in, uh, in our business knew or were lucky or whatever, but they managed to make the right choice on, bi on the big opportunities that would come along. And if, if, they, were, if, they, if they did, then you kind of to feed off of that for a long time and, uh, and, and it begets you know, other businesses. But if you're wrong, then you have to cut your losses pretty quickly and get out of it. Or if you stick with it too long, then you're just going to die. Yes? How long um, would you guys generally <coughs> spend on an elephant type of business before you figured out that it wasn't going to make any money and so you had to actually cut it off? parameters or benchmarks that you said? No. No. Um, we had, you know, we had one that came up a couple of years ago. In, in Brazil, all of the farmers, okay, were going bankrupt because the currency, the, the Brazilian currency had appreciated so much um, that um, their exports were getting hammered, right? They're exporting soybeans or whatever, right? So, um, uh, there, I mean, relative to dollars, of course, um, the dollar had weakened a lot. So actually, from a dollar buyer's perspective, the soybean or whatever is a lot more expensive. Um, but at the same time, they were buying, um, well, they had a bad crop, and they had drought and so forth, so they were under a lot of pressure. So anyway, so the government decided they're gonna step in and try to bail out these farmers. Um, so um, the, the debt the farmers had was, was these massive receivables to people like Cargill, you know, like people who were selling them like fertilizers and this kind of stuff. So um, they decided to package all these receivables, which they're a couple billion in size, and try to sell and try to put a government guarantee on them. And then they came to, to, to us and they said, can you, if we were to do this and structure it this way, would you be able to sell it to people and, and get, uh, or, or take the risk yourself and, and earn money on it? So it was a big deal and it looked like we could make a big spread and, you know, but there are all these moving parts, like the government is there and you have all these suppliers and you have the farmers. And, you know, it, it was sort of a dream, you know, like, Looks like it looks like a great idea, you know. Like we're in, we're uniquely positioned to take this business. Like there are all kinds of reasons why it, it looked like a good a good uh, big trade to do, and it might lead to other business and so forth. But um, you know, after about two days of sort of solid conference calls and talking about it, it became pretty clear, at least to a few of us, that this was never going to work. But you know, you're in a big organization and there were still a lot of people who thought it would work, right? And who were continually pushing it. So, you know, you have to sort of respect that, right? You don't know if you're right <laughs> or, or not. Um, you just have to, you have to respect that and, and just 
play along, right? And never let the ball be in your court. Make sure that, you know, if there's ever anything that needs to get done with that deal to keep it moving, that you do it, you keep it moving along. But you don't put, you don't invest in it, okay? And, um, and so we managed to sort of extract ourselves from that deal. It never happened, and we didn't have to spend too much time on it. But um, I think it does become sort of a judgment call, especially early, early in your career, like with new traders, they'd have these great ideas, like what if we did, you know, what if we did this or what if we did that? Like we had a new, a new trader who was running our Argentina book, and her idea was to sell options on local government bonds in Argentina, which sounds like a great idea. But you know, the bonds themselves are so illiquid that it would cost an arm and a leg just in bid offer spread to trade options on government bonds in Argentina. Um, but you know, we're not, we're not, we don't know if we're right either. So we said, well, why don't you work on it a little bit and see, you know, and then after working on it, you know, and she banged her head against the wall for, for a couple of weeks, she just, she came to our conclusion. Okay, okay, well, okay, I won't work on it. But it takes some time and right? people have to learn. And maybe she would have been right. right? Maybe it would have worked. So you can never say right up front if it's something going to work or not. Um, but at some point, you start to develop a judgment about when to stop, when to, when to like, cut your losses and move on. And so I think over time, we, um, as a desk, we sort of um, develop that capability. But it is, it, it's not an easy thing to learn. And, and I guess my, you know, the advice I always had for people coming in was you know, listen to people who've been in the business for a while. You know, like, um, and they should also listen to you, okay? If you have an idea, then they should respect your idea, but at the same time, you should respect their opinion about whether this is gonna work or not. Um, and, uh, and just because your idea doesn't work doesn't mean that you should, you know, you should lose your, your motivation or, or, or stop trying. Because at the end of the day, the lifeblood of any business is someone who is, is an entrepreneur, someone who wants to do something new. Um, so if you have a good boss, he'll encourage that type of thinking. He may try to guide you a little bit um, and, and make, make sure that that is as productive as it can be. But, um, should never try to like put you in a box or or make you do a certain task, you know, one task all the time. You should allow you some latitude to do your own thing, right? And and maybe you'll come up with the next great thing. You should always he should he or she should respect that that possibility. Um, there was one one other kind of idea one one other thing that. It goes along the same lines. We call it, we, we, used to, we used to call it the power of the idea, right? Like in financial services, you really don't have a product, right? You, you don't have, um, you have an investment. Your, your products are investments, right? Or, or trading ideas. Um, so they all, you can think of them in your head, right? And they, they have a very short life cycle. Um, and th what really drove whether you made money or not is, the idea itself, you know, not the production cost or anything like that. It's not like a manufacturing company. Um, so the idea is what really drove business. And if you had a good idea, right, then <coughs> you're, you, well, you didn't know if you had a good idea or not, but we were constantly brainstorming ideas, right? And, and so we, we had new people, the older people on the desk, we'd all get together and talk about our trading ideas like once a week. And um, those meetings always generated some kind of, always generated money at some level for our desk. So, so the, uh, the idea itself is what really drove activity. It's what made people pay attention to you. It's what um, attracted resources to you um, as a business person. And, um, and it's what made you successful. So, you know, being creative, right? And that gets back to sort of this idea of you know, hiring people who are sort of entrepreneurs. Um, but being creative and seeing that what you're doing is intending to make money, right? End of the day, every action <laughs> at some level had to be um, associated with trying to make money for, for, for the firm. Um, 
So there's this linkage, which was very important between really every idea <laughs> and making money. There was one fellow, um, and I kind of learned this early in my career, but I'm going to say Citibank. The Citibank was a more bureaucratic place, and um, there was a fellow there who was an associate like me, and he worked in a different department. And he was a type of fellow who was kind of, you know, always thinking of like more efficient ways to do things, and he'd have, he'd type up like the agendas of meetings, and he would like post schedules up, and he'd, you know, he, he was kind of like a really good, you know, administrator. Um, but when things got ugly in 91, 92, um, he got fired, and I th thought, well, why did why would, why would they fire someone like that who seemed to be on top of things and really is on the ball? But really, none of the activities that he was doing had anything to do with making money. And that's really what drives, you know, success at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> And it's kind, of a, it's kind of a crass, you know, direct <laughs> linkage here. But, you know, I guess at the end of the day, that's what really drives all the business, right? And if you're, if you're making money, you'll be fine, right? If, if what you're doing is not in some way leading to making money, then at some point, um, people start asking, you know, why you're there. And, um, and so... We were constantly sort of trying to question ourselves, like, okay, how is this going to make us money? If we want to do this, we have this meeting, okay, how is this going to help us eventually <laughs> make money um, with what we're doing in our, in our business? So it's, there was kind of a, you know, a very tight focus on that. And I would actually encourage you, if you go into banking or like any business, you should always know, like, how what you're doing is helping your firm make money. Your boss should be able to explain that to you. <laughs> and you know, if you if you feel like you're not in an area that is adding a lot of value, then you should really think about getting into an area that is adding value, or dreaming up a way that that you can add, you can actually make money. Take take an you know, entrepreneurial entrepreneurial mindset to to your job. Um, okay. Yes. Um, when I think of like a, a large corporation like City, I don't think of a real entrepreneurial spirit necessarily. So, you say that comes more from just individual employees like yourself, or was there something in the hierarchy that kind of? Well, there, there's some art parts of the of the bank that's jo whose job it is to make money, right? And there's, you know, people who are actually lending money, right? Bankers, their job is to make money, right? They're on the line to make. They're making decisions, right? That. And then most of the people around them sort of support that activity. So, um, you know, what we would always tell new people is you try to get as close as you can to the area that's making money. Like trade, in, on a trading desk, the trader is the one who's making money. Um, in a bank, right, it's the banker. You know, in a manufacturing company, it's, you know, it's probably a good question. I don't, I don't know who exactly what area. It ought to be a production area probably, not a support area. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of the approach that we'd always encourage people to do, is just try to get as close as you can from a career perspective, right, to the people who are making the decisions, right, that make money, right, for the, for the firm. Um, my question is, with your clients, do they just sort of have a required rate of return and then through these derivatives you can meet them? Or do they want to be involved in that and understand it? Um, you know what I mean? No, they wanted to understand exactly what they were buying, like most of the time. Um, and they were professionals, like we were, we were you know, they, they were professional money managers. They knew what they wanted. Okay. So we didn't have to explain to them why they, well, sometimes we, we would, but normally we wouldn't have to explain to them why they should buy our product. Well, all we would say is, you know, you can either, okay, you want to buy this bond or this, you want this exposure, you can either get it this way and earn 10% on it, you can do it this way, and earn 11% on it. Which one would you rather have? And then, you know, th this one has a few additional risks. It's a derivative, it has some liquidity issues. So you have to decide whether the additional 1% is, is worth it or not to you. What sort of percentage were you guys making on top of that? Uh, you know, a good product, like um, elephant products, like when you first start, like the first trade, 
we would make like two or three percent, and then it would immediately, like, almost immediately, like the second trade, it would be like, you know, less than two, and then it kind of dribbles down over time, right? So we could protect our spreads usually for three to six months on, on products, but it, it, was, it wasn't like a, you know, 2% and then zero. It's kind of like, just, it's kind of a linear um, deterioration of the spread. And then eventually it become a commodity and we just kind of go, we don't care anymore. Question. Yeah. Just uh, about the employee thing again too, what would be your recommendation for just, you know, someone that's going to college or working their job or whatever, obviously you brought up trying to move yourself into value adding positions, trying to move yourself into those sort of areas. What other things would you suggest people do to help, I don't know, like kind of put themselves in that entrepreneurial mindset where maybe they're like a kind of a chicken entrepreneurship, if you will, where they don't necessarily start their own <coughs> business, but they can be entrepreneurial in someone else's business. Does that make sense what I'm asking? Like, so they can have those skills when they go to an interview, like what you're looking for, they can, they can be that person, yeah. I guess. What, do you have any advice? Yeah, I, I, I looked at a bunch of resumes, and I interviewed a bunch of people, and um, everyone had their own little thing. Like some people were doing dry cleaning you know, on campus. They did, started up a dry cleaning service on campus. Um, most of the ones that uh, you know, I would talk to, of course, were financial oriented, right? They were, they were, tra they were actually, you know, they, they were involved in like the finance club when they had a portfolio of stocks that they traded and they had, you know, a, they could show that they either made money or lost money or at least they had an opinion <laughs> on the market, you know. Um, and I like talking to people like that because then, you know, it shows, it shows first of all, you know, okay, the basic concept between like between entrepreneurial you know, thought process is you know, buy it here and you sell it here, right? And, so stocks are a great place, right? I mean, at least you kind of enjoy making money by buying something low and selling it high, right? And and, um, and so I'm those, you know, I can't really tell you, you know. I'm obviously, it's like I guess it depends on your your situation, you know. But um, uh, you know, one thing that anybody could do is get involved in an investment club or whatever, even if it's phony money. And you know, have an experience of making decisions about what to do with some with your money, right? If you buy, you know, it forces a lot of discipline because the market is a good disciplinarian and forces you to sort of think through your assumptions. And then you every day, you know, if you're right or wrong, and you can kind of test your assumptions that way. So I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah. okay. Um, okay. So last thing. Um, I said at the beginning, like, there, there are hard skills, right, and soft skills, and most people have the hard skills already. So, um, you know, like knowing how to price things, knowing how to model things, knowing the theory behind, um, in, our, in my business, you know, um, you know, inflation and, you know, they kind of had the basic macroeconomic stuff down. But what really drove success was not the hard skills, because those are given, right? It's really the, the soft skills. Um, and the soft skills, I would, I, I kind of put a bunch of them down that I, that I at least in, in my own business, were really important. Um, you know, the first one is really com communication. Like, you could have someone, we had brilliant people on our desk, like PhDs in physics, who didn't know how to communicate could not communicate with you. Like you couldn't have a conversation with them. Um, and so, you know, it's, <laughs> you could be brilliant, but um, if you can't express yourself to somebody, right, in an email or verbally or whatever, it becomes very difficult for you to be successful. Um, second one, knowing, knowing how to get along with people, I mean, you know, um, banking, I guess, any service industry is very people-oriented, right? And so being able to accept people of, like, every possible background, okay, is extremely important. Because what you do know, one thing you do know is that you do not have a corner on anything, right? You don't know. Like, the longer you're in, you're in any kind of business, the more you realize that you don't know anything, right? The less, the, 
The longer you're in it, the more you understand that you don't know, you, <laughs> that you don't understand it. <laughs> and so you have to rely on other people, okay, to explain things to you or to help you uh, understand things. And um, a crucial part of that is getting along with, with all kinds of people, like being totally accepting of other people. And, um, you know, their backgrounds might be a reason why um, that they understand things better than you. Um, so getting along with people. Um, third thing was knowing how to work within a network of peers. Like most businesses are not very hierarchical, right? Like people have no reason to listen to you, <laughs> right? If you're in a group of like everyone's on the same level, they have no reason to listen to you unless you bring your own ideas or you can, you know, the, that's why the idea becomes very important, right? The idea becomes the reason that you add value. Um, but it really helps if you kind of smooth the way by getting to know people <laughs> a little bit. Like we had a, a network of bankers spread out from like every, in every city, in, every major city in, in Latin America. And we were sitting in New York and, you know, our customers would say, oh, can you get us some bonds in Uruguay, right? So we got to pick up the phone and call somebody in Uruguay. There's no reason for them to even pick up the phone. I mean, they, they work for Citibank, but guys come from New York. I get paid based on my revenue here. I'm making money here. Like, why should I stick out my neck for anybody, right? So you have to sell yourself and the reason why you're calling them and how, what you're going to do is benefit them. And so this connection between the idea and the money and, you know, I'm, doing, I'm trying to help you. You're going to help me, of course, but I'm trying to help you too. You know, there's this mutual um, uh, beneficial, you know, mutually beneficial relationships, right, that have to be forged in order for you to get anything done. So, um, you know, knowing how to work within a team is extremely important, right? Working within especially a team of people who you have no incentive to work with you other than your personality or the idea that you can sell them or the benefit you're going to give them. Um, so we always look for people who are really, really good. Like every, team playing is like, you know, uh, everybody's heard that term a million different ways. But I mean, really, real good team players are people who actually invest in the team, right? And um, and we need we looked a lot for people who who really knew how to work in a team. And we found that people who were not good, good team players didn't last very long at all. Because if you're a little island, you're not sharing information and no one's sharing information with you after a while, then you won't succeed. So it's easier for you just to leave than, than, and, and for the organization to get someone else in. Um, one big thing is developing trust with people. Um, this is a soft skill. I put it as a separate thing because trust is, um, you know, particularly in, in a financial services job and in new products, you had to get lawyers, tax people, and risk management people to sign off on anything that you did, anything new that you were going to do. These people are not paid based on your re the revenue that your product is going to generate. They're paid just salary and kind of, you know, a general fixed bonus that was not determined by you. So they had no incentive to go along with you. Um, in fact, they would look for ways to say no, right, to what you're doing. Um, so trust becomes the absolute most important thing. You could never have the, the slightest dishonesty with them because they'd always pick up on it and catch you. And if, you know, once, once you're dishonest one time, okay, with, with a person like that, then you're done with that person. Or it takes a long time for you to build it back up. So it's, it's um, you know, trust is uh, extremely, extremely valuable and rare. There's a, say, there's a, there's a saying, um, the highest currency is respect, right? Not, it's not dollars, it's not euros, it's not gold. The highest currency is respect. And, um, you know, developing respect of, of you, right, and other people is worth a lot more than, you know, um, you know, just even if you look at it in a crass way financially, it's worth a lot more financially to you longer term um, than anything else you could do. And, um, you know, 
we found, I, I found, with working over like a decade with the same control people, um, that you know, the, if you slowly build up trust with them, your job becomes so much easier, right? Their job is easier, your job is easier, they trust you that you're not going to do anything that will make their, their life difficult. You'll point out things that they maybe miss <laughs> for their job, you know, they'll point out things that maybe would help you. You know, it becomes very, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a much easier, it's much easier, right, to work when you have trust in a relationship. And it can be so easily destroyed just by doing something just stupid, right? Like withholding information or not disclosing something that you should have disclosed. So, um, so trust is very important. Um, another, another feature that kind of defined success for people was ownership. And this gets back to entrepreneur, kind of the entrepreneurial approach. But some people would come to work and they didn't own anything, right? They didn't own a mistake. <laughs> They didn't own, you didn't feel like they owned the business. You felt like they were punching a clock and coming in every day and just punching a clock. Um, and, you know, the further you are away from the sort of the money making part of the business, the greater tendency there is to do that. Um, but we find, you know, people who kind of because of the, because of their maybe, you know, where they went to school or whatever else, they, they were in a back office function. But if they owned, their job, right? They owned their business. They would always shine because everyone else around them <laughs> would not, right? And then they had mobility, right? Because they owned what they did. They actually cared. Um, you know, they they um, showed some initiative. They put in the extra hours that they needed to. They didn't blame other people for mistakes. They owned their own. They owned their job. And um, we always look for people who had owners who were taking ownership. Um, and uh, one other, a couple other things, two other things. Um, apolitical. Now, I didn't always agree, believe this, okay, because politi you know, politics is, I saw people who were political go, you know, way up the organization and are still there. Um, but for myself, and I think for most people, um, there's an old saying, you know, keep your head down and make money, okay? That's your best uh, job security. And uh, in bad times, um, you know, you don't need to be political if you've made money. <laughs> if you weren't making money, you had to be political. That was kind of the way, that's, that's the way, that's the jaundiced view that, you know, I had of, uh, of that, uh, of those people who were that way. But um, I always felt like uh, in our business, keeping, your head down and making money was your best job security, and it, it definitely worked. It worked for me. Um, you know, everyone's political to some degree, and of course, you should. If you do something good, you should make sure people know about it. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so I'm not really talking about that that type of thing. I guess all I'm saying is, you know, focusing on your own, you know, your own contributions and making sure that you have contributions, and not trying to kind of take other people's contributions. And, um, uh, but, you know, ultimately if you are, if you're the reason that, the, that your firm has made, has made this, this money, then people will respect that. Um, okay, and the last one is actually more if you're a boss, but there's some, you know, um, protecting your subordinates. And I guess you, this is how you know you have a good boss. Um, I had, I had some bosses who were pretty nasty. And, um, you know, after the Mexican peso crisis, we, had, we actually had some trading positions that lost money. And um, the Mexican peso was, after, after it was linked to the dollar for a long time. And then during the crisis, the, the Mexican government, government could not afford to hold the, the peg to the dollar anymore. So they just let it float. And so the Mexican peso went from, I don't remember, like, to two to the dollar to like five or six to the dollar, like literally overnight. Now we had some short volatility positions on the Mexican peso. So if you know about trading volatility, and if your short volatility and volatility goes up, then you lose money, right? You start losing money pretty, pretty quickly. So we ended up, we, we lost like a million bucks a day for like a couple of weeks. And um, 
uh, we made some back in other parts of our book and so forth, but we still were, we were all sweating out this uh, position. And, and my, my boss's boss, who, who knew all about this, right, um, is talking, you know, he gets, he gets a visit from his boss, never, who we never even saw ever, and he comes down and says, what's going on with this book? We heard about, you know, you, you guys are making money. And, they're losing money, and he said, "Yeah, yes, these guys over here—they're losing all this money. You know, um, I don't really know what they're doing, but they seem to be losing money every day, right?" And the guy knew exactly what we were doing, and and we heard that, we overheard it, and we were like, "You know what? This guy is—you know—we we know now what he's like, and um, and we spent the rest of our time there trying to get out from under him, right? Like trying to move our business so we could report to somebody else." because we didn't trust that he would defend us um, in, a, in a difficult situation. So you don't really know how good a boss is until you get to a bad situation. Um, but a good boss, and we've had a number of good bosses since this time, uh, will always uh, defend you if you are, you know, if you're, li if, if you're kind of sticking to the rules um, and, you're, and you didn't violate any rules and you are just doing your best and, and trying to work out of a bad situation, because they happen, you know, everybody. Um, so, that's kind of the soft, those are the kind of the soft, the soft <coughs> skills. Um, and I, so I had one other thing, which I'll share with anyone. If you have any questions, please. Um, but I found that um, this is a general characteristic of people, but I found that People who kind of, you know, people in the financial services industry in New York, pretty much the same, all, all had a very similar mindset. Um, they worked in a bank, okay, so they were exposed to the banking industry. Um, they had real estate in New York, they are exposed to New York real estate. They typically got paid in stock and cash. So if they had they paid in stock, they got paid in stock of Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns or Citigroup, right, in my case. Um, and if effectively, they had absolutely no diversification, right? They're like 90% exposed from a financial perspective, <laughs> right, to the financial services industry in New York. And um, when things go south, Okay, and if you're in that position, things are going bad for you or for the whole industry, then it leads to really bad decision making. Um, it, it pushes you into risks that you would otherwise not take with your career, with your investments, maybe with your family. Um, it increases the costs of failure um, because you, you are kind of selling into the absolute worst market um, and it increases the risk that you're going to be dishonest or disloyal or just stupid about what you do. Um, so diversification is, is nice, you know, a nice word that everybody's heard, but it actually has extremely important um, implications, right, if you're in a career. Um, and there are so many examples that we've heard in the last couple of months about people even like CEOs of big companies who have leveraged themselves to buy stock in their own company, right? And lost everything. <laughs> um, these are bright business people, they're not stupid people. And, um, and so, you know, just being savvy with your own personal management means that you'll be, could put you on a virtuous cycle where you can be successful. But being stupid about the way you manage your own personal affairs it puts you on a vicious cycle where you can do, do, do really, really stupid things. So um, that's kind of my last point. Um, any questions? Any other questions? Um, from what it sounds like, you came with all like, these, these great entrepreneurial ideas and stuff like that for these companies that you work for. Have you done anything on your own, like your own businesses or started your own investing nope. type things? No, nope. I haven't. For I've always been, you know, it's been, you know, um, work was like, seven to whatever, working hours were like seven to like seven usually. And I was just like, you know, the thing is, it, it, 
it, I think it's, I think it, for me now, it's a good thing to do. And so I think it's, for me, personally, it's fun for me to sort of look at this type of thing. I've seen a lot of, you know, I've, I've looked at some things and, and I, you know, I'm so conservative that I, I don't, you know, I haven't invested in anything. But um, I'm looking for the right thing, so. And like how you did like a bunch of like stocks and bonds and stuff like that, do you, are you heavily involved with that yourself, investing that way in the stocks? From uh, my own money, yeah, yes. But I mean, you know, it's, it's an investing portfolio, it's not a trading portfolio. It's something that I really enjoy doing, like I love doing research, and, but I, I don't trade very often. I just, I kind of have a static, I, I'm an index guy and I have a static portfolio and I kind of just, Watch it and um, try not to lose money. <laughs> I guess too for like a bunch of us and stuff like that. What kind of advice would you give for us if we got into like stocks and bonds and whatnot, especially with the way the market is going right now? Like, do you have any good advice for us and ways to invest? Well, and the, only, the only thing I would say, I mean, as I tell my class, um, the best investment always is well, not always, not always. I shouldn't say that, but one of the best. One of the absolute best investments you can do is, is um, paying off debt. So if you, it, you know, if you have credit card debt and, and you want to invest, some, you have money to invest, it's like, why? <laughs> why would you ever do that? But if you have a dime of credit card debt, why would you put any money in the market? It makes no sense at all. Right? Because it, you know, credit card, if you think about your, you think about it as an investment like any other investment, right? If you save money, if you avoid a liability, it's just as good as making money, right? And if you spend 100 bucks paying off credit card debt at 13 or 14 percent, it's absolute guaranteed 13 or 14 percent. You cannot get that. You, that's the long-term return of the stock market is is well below that, right? So why would you ever put money in stocks if you have credit any credit card debt at all? It makes no sense at all. But people, you know, people do that all the time. So for students, you know, I say, well, okay. A couple things. You should have your debt under control, largely under control, and you should have a bunch of cash in a cushion. And then if you have extra money and you think it's long-term 30-year money or whatever, then go ahead and put it in stocks. But why would you put it in stocks if you didn't have you know, your debt largely under control or a big cash cushion, right? Because if you need the money for an you know, emergency expense, and you have to sell stocks, it's always going to be at the wrong time. Always. <laughs> it's, the, it's like the law of the market. So uh, basically, you'd want to, the debt that you have at a fairly conservative interest rate, obviously, like your mortgage and some like vehicle payments and stuff like that, you just want to look at what your return projected is in your investments and make sure that it's higher than the interest you're paying right. elsewhere, right? Yeah. Because remember, the long-term return of the stock market is, depending on how you measure it, like 7, 8, 9%, right? So, and that's with a lot of risk, right? That if you had an absolute guaranteed 5% return or 6% return, why wouldn't you take that instead of the stock market, right? Why would you, why would you take, why would you think that the stock market's going to give you anything better? <laughs> yes? Um, kind of moving from business to and I hope this is appropriate around. I'm just curious, how did you balance family life as being an investment banker in New York City, working from seven to seven? Well, I wasn't an investment banker. I was a trader, okay. which helped a lot, actually, because I never had to work on the weekends. <laughs> and I could, I could, you know, I could leave, say, between six and seven range, which got me home, say, eight, eight thirty, like Monday through Thursday. Friday, I usually got home six or so. So it was okay. I mean, it was manageable. It was a, it was a pain, I have to say. You know, especially you know, over time, it's w very wearing. But um, it worked. It worked out so far. You know, it's like like on wood. Yes. Why don't we um, give Paul a hand? We'll move it upstairs for any additional questions. So we've got some uh, presumably ice cream is melting. And oh, okay. Great. Okay.